Welcome everybody to our first event of the Center for European Studies, this um, academic year 2021, I guess it is that we're finally here. Um, I am the new director of the Center for European Studies. Um, I have taken over from the extraordinary Belinda Davis, uh, who has set um, quite a remarkable example. So I'm, and I'm, I'm looking forward to living up to it. Um, we are mostly online this semester um, because of transition issues with the pandemic. Uh, we're hoping to be fully back um, in the spring. And also because of some of the complexities that we've had to deal with around um, um, the flooding. Uh, we are um, uh, going to be hosting a number of very exciting events. Um, the next one coming up is the Afghanistan Roundtable on Monday and uh, the 20th. And then right after that on the 29th is the um, uh, Germany after Merkel Roundtable. We will also be co-hosting an event on September 22nd uh, with Ata Quaison and Mara Di Gennaro about Mara's new book on global modernism. So uh, we, and I will keep sending out those announcements and blasts. Um, today's lecture is part of our uh, colonialism, interwar Europe and archaeopolitics um, uh, collaboration. The center has undertaken this with um, the Stavros Nauros Foundation Hellenic Studies Program at uh, Simon Fraser University and the Art and Archaeology Division at the National and Capodistrian um, University at Athens. Um, my um, fellow collaborators are all here, all the vessel is not here in um, vision or rather in image, he is here, I think in spirit, um, um, uh, are Dimitri Kralis, uh, director of the Center for Hellenic Studies at SFU, uh, Irini Kotsavili, um, also at SFU, a professor there. Dimitri Plansos, um, I think, what is a director of the Art and Archaeology Division and Ace Archaeologist in um, Athens um, at the National and Capodistrian University in Fessel Devji, um, uh, historian of South Asia and professor at Oxford. Um, and I think the, also heading the South, South Asia Center vessel. I'm not sure, but I don't. I don't want to make uh, mistakes by canceling other people's um, leadership roles and and installing my friends. So um, it's thrilling to be part of this group. Um, we're hoping to be uh, hosting an October uh, 21st another event for this here at the center, um, and. Um, we will be having a workshop in Athens, which we will be announcing to, um, at least in theory, it will be in Athens, but we don't know yet what the travel plans will be. Um, I am going to now turn this over to Dimitri Kralis, who is going to inter, um, introduce our speaker and, um, you know, sort of announce the protocols of uh, how we're going to proceed today. Thank you very much, Dimitri for uh, both of the Mitris for joining us and everybody else and our attendees. Please do um, jump in with questions after, at the end and also um, uh, reach out to us and uh, you can put it in chat if you want to be part of our mailing list and are not already, um, um, you know, for our announcements. All right, Dimitri, over to you. Oh, thank you, Sadia, so much. Uh, good evening from Athens. Uh, my name is Dimitri Kralis, and uh, as director of the Stavros Niakos Foundation Center for Hellenic Studies at Simon Fraser University, I'm uh, delighted to be collaborating with the Rutgers Center for European Studies and the Archaeology and Art History Division of the National and Capodistrian uh, University of Athens on the Colonialism, Interwar Europe, and uh, Archaeopolitics uh, series. Uh, tonight, or as the case may be, uh, day in uh, North America. I'm uh, delighted to introduce the inaugural speaker for uh, our series, Dr. Dimitris Planzos, who's professor of classical archaeology at the National and Capodistrian University of uh, Athens. 
which is uh, also my alma mater. Uh, so Dr. Planzos uh, specializes in um, Greek art and um, archaeology, archaeological uh, theory, and contemporary and modern receptions of um, classical culture. Graduating with a BA in uh, history and uh, archaeology from Athens, he received his uh, MPhil and uh, DPhil in classical archaeology from the University of Oxford. After postdoctoral and curatorial work, uh, Dr. Planzos taught at the University of Ioannina before joining the National Cappadocian University in Athens. His uh, many monographs and edited volumes have been uh, published uh, in the UK, Greece, and uh, the US, and his contributions are both specialized but also directed to audiences of uh, students and lay persons, a direct testament to Dr. Planzos' role as an academic researcher, educator, and public uh, intellectual. Uh, writing aside, Dr. Planzos is uh, an active field archaeologist and co-director of the Argos Restifon excavation project. In recent, year, in recent years, he has been actively participating in public discussions regarding the role of archaeology in contemporary societies, as well as the uses of the classical past in nationalism, post-colonial thinking, and modern and postmodern governmentality. His paper today, titled Archaeopolitics, the Second Life of Statues, fits uh, within this very rubric and will, to put it as succinctly as uh, possible, be discussing ways in which ancient statues tend to become entangled in contemporary political agendas. Before I cede the digital floor to uh, Dimitris, let me offer a note on uh, uh, procedure. Uh, first off, please note that this is a recorded uh, session and that will be available for viewing at a later stage. Uh, furthermore, once the talk is completed, we will open the floor to questions. For purposes of uh, efficiency, we ask you to submit your questions on the Zoom uh, chat box. In my capacity as a moderator, I will be monitoring those questions and will read them to Dr. Planzos, who will in turn uh, address them. That being said, let me pass the floor to Dr. Planzos. Hello. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitri. Thank you, Sadia. And thank you, Radkers. Thank you for the hospitality. Um, today, it's very exciting indeed to inaugurate this uh, series, and I do hope we all meet, we all get to meet in Athens in, in January. Um, so, let me start with a rather recent example, a case study. <clears throat> on June 7, 2020, only last year, a crowd of demonstrators pulled down from its pedestal in the heart of the English city of Bristol, the, sta the bronze statue of Edward Colston, defaced it in red and blue paint, rolled it down the seafront and threw it into the harbor. We probably all remember this. 10 days uh, or so later in Washington DC, a different crowd of protesters attacked the Equestrian statue of Andrew Jackson, the American statesman and army general who went on to become the seventh president of the United States. The two events, seemingly unrelated, were clearly linked to the global wave of protests following the murder of George Floyd, a 46-year-old black man by two policemen in Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota. Several similar incidents of statues of great men being uh, defaced, destroyed, or otherwise degraded took pl uh, place across the world during that time of unrest. What triggered these attacks was a generalized sense of anger against the ideologies and acts those statues represented. Colston, long celebrated as one of England's great philanthropists, has also been exposed as a slave trader, and Jackson was a slave owner whose plantations prospered uh, through cotton trade. Edward uh, Ward Carmack, um, shown here, uh, was a lawmaker and newspaper editor in Nashville and Memphis in the early 1900s, who endorsed the lynching of free black men who were trying to open the grocery store. In the eyes of the destroyers, these seemingly innocent works of public art appeared as ideological powerhouses, to use the phrase coined by Verity Platt. Their artfully ex executed bodies of bronze or marble were found to compress entire systems of authority diffused through the social system by a ruling class disguised as a benevolent band of merry art lovers. What comes across with such actions of public violence 
is a strong political message penetrating our present field of vision. For we, all, we all by now understand that the past uh, materialities we theorize, uh, consume, and recycle as art may, and most uh, commonly are, used as carriers and generators of political meanings in and about the present. And although monuments like the statues shown here have long been recognized as agents of a state-driven politics of memory, we need to uh, work quite a bit more on the strategies and the templates, the gestures, the performances, such politics entails. This deeply biopolitical strategy of allowing the past to inform and regulate the present, I call archaeopolitics. Uh, not so much in the sense um, of a politically driven or burdened archaeology, which is the sort of use um, most common now, but more with an archaeologically configured politics in mind. Um, so not so much as uh, in a sense of, a, of a, an archaeology that becomes uh, political, but in a sense of a politics that becomes archaeological. Four, um, if monuments like uh, the three bronze statues mentioned here need to be edited in order to reflect our present resolution to form a society more just, more inclusive, less censored than the societies we inherited from the 19th and the 20th century, then so does our relationship with the past and its material remains at large. Our collective archaeophilia uh, it would seem to me, our apparently shared drive to live our present through constant archaeologists of the past has enabled these systematic employments of politics of a life, a bios, a bios, that presents itself as an abiosis more often than not or than it should. What I will be arguing today is that through repetitive performances of a seemingly inherent love of things ancient, we as bodies, as communities, as national subjects, as supranational congregations, or cyber citizens inhabiting fast emerging global escapes have learned to adapt to the authoritarian archeopolitics of our present or often enough issue deploy our own archaeopolitics. This drive I shall call archaeomentality later on, that is the management of life and living as an archaeologic ritual taken to its extreme, even if this means a politics of death and of dying. A politics that in its negation of life ends up disavowing the very past it is supposed to venerate. But let me revert to the examples I have promised you in my um, abstract. Um, let's go back to July 1939. Um, it is the 11th of July and a bizarre ceremony uh, is taking place in the seaside town of Tarragona in northeastern Spain. Gian Galeazzo Ciano, second count of Cortellazzo and Bucari, and Italy's Minister of Foreign Affairs at the time, was received by Serrano Sunier, a Spanish Minister of the Interior, for the public unveiling of a statue of Roman Emperor Augustus. The effigy of the long dead monarch was made a antica as a replica of the well-known Prima Porta type, if there are any archeologists in the group. Um, the two dignitaries uh, entered the town by car, and receiving the enthusiastic welcome by the cheering public. They were driven through streets adorned with fake Roman columns and, and arches decorated with Spanish and Italian flags sprinkled with Latin slogans praising the glory of Rome, ancient and modern. Uh, they then walked through the town's so-called archeological promenade and the Italian minister unveiled the statue, which was covered with a Spanish flag. Then came speeches by the two men musing over uh, the Roman identity, Interdidad Romana, and the imperial greatness, Grandeza Imperial, of the two countries. Spanish daily La Vanguardia described the whole affair as a triumphal tour 
excursion triumphal, also alluding to the ceremony's Roman genealogy. Um, let me just state here that I owe this information and references to the press and movie clips from the time to Vasilis Balaskas, a PhD student of mine with whom we will be soon publishing these documents in a joint paper on fascism and the spectacular. Now, um, Tiano and Sunier um, served under Europe's most prominent fascist dictators of the 20th century, Mussolini and Franco. Central to the day's proceedings, as well as to the two countries' rapprochement following a period of distrust um, while Spain was under democrat rule, was the idea of Romanità, a concept introduced to modern politics by Mussolini himself. Italian nationalism often turned to Italy's Roman heritage from 1870 onwards. It is, however, with the Ventennio Fascista, the 20 year fascist rule starting with Mussolini's rise to power in 1925, that the idea of Romanità, from the Latin Romanitas or Romanness, became a central issue in current politics. As has been observed by scholars studying Mussolini's own ties with Roman antiquity, and the idea of Romanità in particular, fascism was of course a modern ideology looking at the future. At the same time, however, looking back at an idealized Roman past, a field of tension in uh, the words of Jan Nellis that provided fascism with much of its dynamic as well as its attraction. The ceremony attended by Siano and Sunier that sunny day in July 1939 was one of a number of occasions where Roman relics were changed between fascist Italy and Spain before and after the establishment of Franco's regime. As such, uh, this ceremony displays many of the characteristics I would assign to what I understand as archaeopolitics. Um, that is a public discourse that is both political and archaeological, in that it feeds off the collective desire for the materialities of the past in order to usher a new sort of political technologies into the present. Um, archaeopolitics, therefore, is an acculturated form of biopolitics assimilated into discourses of the past rather than the present or the future. Um, as described by Michel Foucault, biopower is uh, the practice of modern nation states to regulate their subjects through the subjugation of bodies and the control of populations. Uh, biopower is enforced through biopolitics, according to Foucault and other thinkers, which is understood as an extensive toolkit of strategies and mechanisms through which human life processes are managed under regimes of authority. Uh, in other words, biopolitics is the process by which biopower is exerted and life is managed with the aim to achieve equilibrium through state regulated mechanisms. Whereas these control mechanisms and modes of intervention are ostensibly there to maintain uh, life, such as uh, massive vaccination, for example, which is um, very much you think of the present right now, um, they do so through the loss of life, or at least through the designation of certain lives as unworthy um, of maintaining. In archaeopolitics, uh, on the other hand, um, control over life, I think, is disguised as a noble kind of love of things ancient, what in Greek we would call archaeophilia, an aspiration to a higher life model that is not imposed to anyone, but ought to be inherently felt by everyone. We're all supposed to love antiquity. As a result, whereas biopolitics strives to organize entire populations according to a newly set disciplinary and regulatory economy, archaeopolitics mobilizes archaeophile sentiments in order to manage life in the present. And as the examples discussed here uh, will show, archaeopolitics is effective because um, it is at the same time corporeal and performative. And we saw that in Spain and we see some more of it later on. 
like biopolitics, archaeopolitics, affects, informs, and enables modern technologies of governmentality. That is the organized practices through which subjects are governed, a concept to which I will return uh, below. Now, through the, through the deployment of classical antiquity as a bio template, these public gestures of archaeophilia were meant to inscribe Mussolini and Franco's fascist notions of empire onto the, their ever ready, always available populations. To a global mass, to paraphrase Foucault, who had been habituated into accepting the authority of classical antiquity as an archetype in the present condition. An archetype, to be sure, confirming the ruler's right, not only to make live, but also to let die. Foucauldian biopolitics, therefore, is not merely about sovereignty and the ruler's ability to govern through the disciplining and punishing of his or her subjects. By exercising its biopower as power over life, this particularly modern form of government redefines the national population and reframes politics itself through both mapping the nation and sorting the bodies of its citizens. For if a nation, if a nation sovereignty is all about maps and the cartographic consummation of the nation's primeval ties with its ancestral land, Modern biopolitics is principally and explicitly about sorting the bodies of its population into those that belong and those that do not. By transferring classical Rome's biopower into Spain and Italy's interwar realities, therefore, the two dictators imbue fascist ideas with the allure of a coveted Romanitas thus reinventing Romanitas as a fascist idea. Those among the population who espouse the fascist ideals are the true Romans, therefore belong to the nation. Everybody else does not belong, therefore their bodies may be sorted away. And it should be added that for all intents and purposes, the version of antiquity, the two dictators, chose to promote, as is always the case with the sort of antiquity promoted by archaeopolitics, was a thoroughly imagined one. It is this notion of a shared classicality among an assortment of other versions of patriotism that would turn the subjects into a well-organized mass of disposable bodies, happy to be made live, as modern versions of, an imagined, uh, of their imagined classical selves, or if it, if it should come to that, to be let die. Now, um, in the remainder of this uh, paper, I will be turning to the 21st century and the case study of contemporary Greece in order further to explore archaeopolitics in its current manifestations. I shall continue with the theme of classicizing statuary and its corporeality as a means to claim national space negotiate historical time, and in effect express political identities, be they already established or still in the making. Um, April 19, 2019, um, a bronze statue of Alexander the Great showing the Greek conqueror as a teenager was unveiled in central Athens. George Kaminis, mayor of Athens at the time, on whose initiative the unveiling had been organized, um, stated at the ceremony that the cultural heritage of Athens is now enriched even further by the addition of the statue in a central spot of the Greek capital. Adding that by showing the Longong king as a boy, uh, the work avoided any militaristic uh, symbolism. This was all part of the, of the press release that day. The statue itself um, a rather mediocre variation on a well-known classical uh, type was the work of Greek modernist sculptor Yanis Papas, 
who had died in 2005. Um, many of whose other creations, mostly effigies of Greek politicians from the 19th and the, the 19th and the 20th centuries, of sort of, they're all men, sort of great Greek men, persistently adorned the city's parks and uh, squares, Venizelos, Tricupis, and others. According to the mayor's press release, Papas had donated his work to the Greek Ministry of Culture in the 1990s, who then passed it on to the municipality. There, it apparently lay forgotten until it was retrieved by Kaminis, resurrected to be planted in one of Athens' most central locations. Now, the timing of um, the statue's sudden resurrection and hasty unveiling was crucial. Kaminis' term of office was about to end less than four weeks after the unveiling, as municipal elections had already been called for the following May to coincide with that year's European Parliament elections for which Kaminis was a candidate for, a, for, an, for an MEP, a member of the European Parliament, but failed to get elected. Nevertheless, Kaminis uh, ran for office once, uh, once again uh, for the July 2019 uh, SNAP national election, where he was appointed to the sole state deputy seat won by his party, Kinal. Kinal means uh, movement for change. Um, now, Kinal, a, a recent mutation of Andreas Papandreou's Pan Hellenic Socialist movement, known as PASOK uh, from the 1970s, had lost most of its electoral gr uh, grasp in the years following the 2009 Greek bailout and subsequent economic recession. In the political turmoil that followed Greece's financial collapse, the socialists found themselves in forced collaboration with the erstwhile arch enemies, the center to ultra right wingers of the New Democracy Party, with whom they formed a series of coalition governments between 2012 and 2015. The unprecedented victory of Syriza, uh, that is, coalition of the radical left in early 2015 sent both the conservatives and the socialists to the opposition, where they worked hard and in unison against their new common enemy. A loose political coalition was thus formed, aided by the onslaught of the Greek crisis. Um, the conviction was forcibly neoconservative, professing a deep disregard for the left and its policies, which they dubbed populist uh, to the core, and a vehement reaction to any sort of political radicalism in favor of an imagined social and cultural elite of which they posed as the self-appointed leaders. Um, in short, what Tariq Ali has acutely described as the extreme center. And surprising as it may sound, Kaminis' sudden inspiration to burden his city's cultural horizon with a classicizing statue of Alexander the Great in the penultimate month of his eight years in office was little more than an archaeopolitical gesture devised to enhance his party's anti-government rhetoric. Now, how can, can a, a, a statue of a long gone king be considered political, you may ask, and why should we suspect Alexander the Great of anti-leftist sentiments more than um, 2300 uh, years after his death. The answer is to be found in the recent, at the time, um, rapprochement between Greece, led by Syriza and its leader, Alexis Tsipras, with what at the time was the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, uh, uh, Firom in short, or simply Macedonia for its friends. As most of our audience today most likely still remembers, uh, Greece had maintained a hardcore stance against the emerging new state back in the 1990s and in the aftermath of the Bosnia War, arguing that the name of Macedonia belonged solely to Greece owing to its antiquity. A sudden surge of Macedonian archeology span took Greek public imagination by storm, aided by a series of important archeological discoveries from uh, the 1970s and the 1980s that brought to light was mo what most scholars believe to be the royal necropolis of Ege lying in the vicinity of present-day 
uh, Regina, a small town securely situated within the Greek borders. These, uh, these uh, archaeological discoveries uh, gave everyone in Greece, scholars, state officials, and the general public alike, legitimate reason to celebrate archaeology and in the face of Manolis Andronikos, um, Virginia's excavator, to honor historical commitment to research as a way of revealing the nation's true origins. Images of the Virginia artifacts were claimed by the national imaginary as symbols of Greekness, which um, somewhat vaguely was a, as a rule taken to be synonymous with Macedonianness. It must be pointed out, however, that the fledgling republic on the other side of the border had a significant part to play in Greece's sudden archaeopolitical hysteria. For Greece's northern neighbors also got their eyes set on Regina and its gold packed tombs, hiding the royal remains of Alexander's father and stepmother and also his grandmother, his son, and perhaps his stepbrother as well. The good thing with this sort of speculative archaeology is that the sky is the limit. Archaeology helped both sides frame their demands as well as question their opponent's legitimacy in theirs. As far as archaeopolitics goes, however, the Macedonian dispute evolved into far more than a mere quarrel over ancient art and its symbolisms classical or modern. Um, fast forward 2019, following months of a, of a new series of negotiations, Greece's left-wing government struck a long overdue pact with Phyrom, um, which from then on was to be referred to as the Republic of North Macedonia, uh, a name that in itself suggests that there's also a South Macedonia territory that once belonged to the ancient kingdom of Macedon, but now is part of the Greek state. Although the new treaty was internationally greeted as a considerable breakthrough, significantly contributing to maintaining the peace in the area, on the national front, political opposition to the Syriza government remained unconvinced. Despite the centrist facades, both the new democracy and Kinal parties rallied their supporters against the treaty turning to their uh, innermost uh, nationalist uh, feelings. As the treaty entered its final ratification stages during the last months of Syriza's term in government in early 2019, its opponents saw fit to use, if not reignite, a widespread nationalist sentiment in Greece as a weapon against the governing left and Alexis Tsipras in person. A number of passionate and sometimes violent rallies were organized in Athens, Thessaloniki, and other Greek towns in the early months of 2019, attacking the agreement and those who made it happen, claiming the deal was treasonous uh, for Greek geopolitical uh, interests. As it was to be expected, Macedonian archaeology was once again deployed as a political argument, as well as a means to forge a militantly xenophobic ethnic identity. Images of Macedonian artifacts were often included in the iconography of the rallies, and often enough protesters came dressed as ancient Macedonians, a gesture surviving or indeed revived from the 1990s. Admittedly, Thessaloniki provided a better scenery for such protests than Athens. Since the mid 1970s, the city has housed on its famous seafront a spectacularly displayed bronze Alexander, shown here, to which a lesser statue of his father Philip was added in the early 1990s um, when the dispute over Macedonia's name was breaking out. Um, in true archaeopolitical fashion, the discovery of the tomb was taken to confirm Macedonia's Hellenicity, and this even if historically speaking, the discovery did not affect our understanding of Macedonian uh, history. Uh, because when it comes to Philip's death, we happen to know precisely when, where, and how he died and excavated his cremated uh, remains in Virginia's tomb too, or elsewhere, would not, add, add, uh, would not add much to the information we already possess. Uh, it would just confirm that he's also, it is uh, 
indeed dead. Um, further, the actual political dispute between Greece and then the then Phyrum was pretty much an unsettled record from the 19th century and had nothing to do with Alexander and the tomb supposed to belong to his father. The two statues, um, therefore, um, were erected in Thessaloniki not as historical landmarks alluding to the city's antiquity, but as visual reminders of the cities and indeed the nations at large struggle against those threatening um, its present by questioning its past. It is certainly no coincidence that the awkward placement of Philip's statue on a random crossroads in downtown Thessaloniki, doing very little to highlight the work's artistic value such as it is, seems only to be explained in view of the city's archaeological museum standing nearby, where at the time of the statue's erection, the spectacular finds from Verena were still exhibited before the remove um, to the uh, museum on the site in Verena itself. Thessaloniki and the Greek side at large um, was not alone in this slyly improvised game of archaeopolitics. North Macedonia, or simply Macedonia, as everyone insisted on calling um, the former Yugoslavian statelet back uh, then, despite Greek protests, based a great share of its diplomatic effort between the early 1990s and the late 2010s uh, on archaeological imagery. In this, North Macedonians were quick to learn from the best, that is the Greek opponents, and very soon a rivaling Macedonian archaeology emerged on the other side of Greece's northern borders, copying the strengths of the original as well as some of its most fundamental flaws. The so-called Skopje 2014 project, named after North Macedonia's capital, is a case in point. Devised around 2010 by Nikola Gruevski, the country's long serving prime minister between 2006 and 2016, um, the endeavor was meant to affirm North Macedonia's national identity by means of a thorough reimagining of the city's public space open to the international gaze, tourist, or other. Uh, this involved a widespread antiquization of North Macedonian urban landscape with an emphasis on classical antiquity, though considerable effort was made to include every period of Macedonian history into a, a hegemonic, seamlessly continuous and ethnically cleansed national narrative following the example of everybody else uh, in the Balkans and notably Greece. The centerpiece of the project was once again a statue a l'antica modeled on Alexander's statuary from the Hellenistic period, even though the authorities at Skopje were careful enough not to identify the monument with the conqueror's name. Coily dubbed warrior on a horse, the 22 meter high statue shows an Alexander lookalike ancient Greek or indeed Macedonian horseman on a thick pillar copying Roman artifacts of the imperial period most, like, most notably the Trajan um, uh, column. Um, as a collection of already outdated copies of European elsewheres, as acutely described by two of its most eloquent critics, uh, Andrew Gran and Alexander Tarkovsky, Skopje 2014 organizes its audience according to a template both exceptionalist and exclusionary. Passers by, locals and visitors alike, are treated with a canonized version of North Macedonian history, facilitated through aesthetic and cultural paradigms borrowed from elsewhere, uh, mostly European neoclassicism. An ironic consequence of this persistent copying is that the version of North Macedonian identity forged by Skopje 2014 is one virtually unrecognized in North Macedonia itself. Um, where the majority of those uh, surveyed um, identify the 19th century as their nation's most defining moment and not classical antiquity. Um, a close study um, of the broad affair between um, Greece and North Macedonia in their 30 year dispute over the name 
shows it to be archaeopolitical in nature. Through an intensive antiquization of public space, material or intellectual, the two countries managed to cleanse the populations as well in true biopolitical fashion. Nationhood is thus restricted to those who can claim to be the sons and daughters of the ancients, at the exception of everybody else, who is thus turned into a lesser citizen, citizen or even a non-citizen. This is most evident in North Macedonia, where ethnic tensions between the Macedonian, the Albanian, and other minorities are still boiling. So in the last few minutes, I attempted a quick survey of the cultural and political phenomenon I had called Macedonian archaeology. That is the ex existential need felt by Greeks and North Macedonians to claim archaeological imageries from a shared and largely imagined classical past in order to assert political benefits at the present. I did this in order to show that this frantic uh, repurposing of public space and the public sphere at large is both crypto-colonialist in the sense explained by Michael Hertzfeld and biopolitical, which is the deeper meaning of archaeopolitics that is both crypto-colonialist and biopolitical. On the one hand, both Greeks and North Macedonians feel compelled to adopt for themselves a cultural iconography invented by others specifically in order to define and, in a sense, discipline the two countries. This is crypto-colonialism. And on the other, both communities resort to archaeology in order both to map their nation as well as sort themselves and others. This is archaeopolitics. As a result, this systematic repurposing of public sentiment over the classical past and this reenacted materialities affects not only the states we all live in, but also the ways in which we live in them as minds as well as bodies. Um, so this is the notion I have already introduced as archaeomentality based on Foucault's idea of governmentality. That is the organized practices through which subjects are governed. I argue that like biopolitics, archaeopolitics affect, inform, and enable modern technologies of governmentality. I will also argue that the archaeopolitical management of current affairs in Greece or anywhere else in the world for that matter, leads to the emergence of a unique sort of governmentality and archaeomentality, so to speak. Governmentality is the art of government, that is the governmental rationale behind techniques and mechanisms of population surveillance, the invention and control of the self, biopower, and biopolitics. In other words, present day governmentality preoccupies itself with social and scientific engineering, affected through the deployment of everyday technologies of the self. Archaeomentality, on the other hand, may be termed the governmental rationale, affected through the prioritization of antiquity over the present, assuming that the love of things ancient is inherent in modern uh, national populations. Archaeolatic regimes thus become encoded into social practices as well as everyday gestures across the nation. Through the enforced naturalness of archaeopolitics, human subjects are gradually taught to comply with subtle regulations and expectations of the social order, from austerity measures to biopolitical sorting within and without the nation state. Um, and this leads me to the concept of biopolitical sorting, which I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation, and I find uh, particularly um, useful in my discussion of archaeopolitics. Uh, for Foucault, the biopolitical moment is when biopower inscribes racism in the mechanisms of the state. Racism, which of course predates the emergence of biopower, becomes through biopolitics the basic mechanism of power as exercised in modernity. Racist technologies, Foucault observed, introduce a break into the domain of life that lies under the control of the state, a break in the biological continuum of the human race, a hierarchical distinction between races or between those deserving to be let live, um, and those who were born without 
this right. The break into the domain of life introduced by racism, the sorting between who must live and who must die is also inscribed in the fabric of our societies by other technologies of power besides racism, such as sexism, uh, queer and transphobia, ageism, ableism, or the distinction between, between us and our primeval political opponents. Even Foucault himself, when he talks of the death um, which those found to be, to be by politically inferior must suffer, hastens to explain that he includes any type of symbolic death, such as political death, expulsion, rejection, and so on. The first decades of the 21st century have seen, I believe, a surge of this type of biopolitical overdetermination, especially when sovereign states seem or believe themselves to be under threat, external or internal. As national discourses therefore become re-racialized and as a result, as a result uh, geocorporeal, the nation's antiquity and its antiquities are more and more systematically inscribed in the running of modern states across the globe as sorting mechanisms separating out the wanted from those whom the state may choose to dispose of. Now, let me also add um, at this point a very brief observation on which I promise to elaborate more in our meeting in Athens this January. To the schemes I have outlined above, I would add my own feeling that such appropriation and counter-appropriation strategies, in fact, constitute projects through which to negotiate and renegotiate whiteness. Um, the concept of a, of a generalized white identity is a rather recent one, as uh, we all know. As a racial discourse, whiteness is designed and continuously redeployed as a tool by means of which to generate and uphold systemic racism chronically associated with the political and cultural elites of the West, classical studies, uh, for one, including the appreciation and study of Greek and Roman art and Greek and Roman statues mostly, have ended up becoming emblematic of white privilege worldwide. As a result, while post-colonial struggles across the globe have often placed classical learning in a rather awkward position as a symbol of imperialism and colonization, think of it, um, overturned statues at the beginning of my paper. At the same time, it may be deployed as a weapon of emancipation, as a means uh, by which the colonized may reclaim their own whiteness. As it has long been argued, um, for example, certain ethnic groups, uh, the most telling example among which being the Irish Americans, had in the 19th and 20th century uh, to reclaim the racial identity as white against an entire set of racist stereotypes perceiving them as culturally inferior and civilized and though certainly not black, not quite white either. Uh, for the Greek immigrants to the United States, the situation must have been similar, if not worse. Um, coming from a country in the periphery of Europe and one still forming part of the Ottoman Empire until the mid 19th century, if not later, Greeks found it difficult to pass as white in their new home unless they claim the cultural and racial affiliations with Hellenism. So, whereas the Irish, for example, reclaim their whiteness based on their Catholic ties and work ethics, the Greeks, like those in the photograph from the 4th of July parade in New York in the 1920s, um, had to negotiate their whiteness on the strength of their classical heritage. So, so here you see them parading as ancient Greeks gods and goddesses of Olympus. This also adds a special meaning to, to this parade um, from the early 2000s, where Greek immigrants in Melbourne stage a Macedonian parade in order to claim their antiquity on the one hand and ownership of a historic land on the other. And all this in a city and a country, Australia, that insists on identifying them merely as walks, um, which sounds rather non-white and certainly not historical enough. 
It is the insinuated link with classical whiteness and its mythologized materiality that affects the racist break uh, and rehabilitates the marginalized or other into a body that matters. So the new statue of Alexander and its inauguration in April 2019 must be examined under this archaeopolitical light. The mayor's decision to go ahead with his gesture at the time of the Prespa agreement came as a blatant attempt to take part in the discussion over the name, over Macedonia's future, and more importantly, over Macedonia's past, which the Greek authorities systematically claimed as the country's sole intellectual property. In doing this, Mayor Kaminis ostensibly hits back at Skopje 2014 and its frivolous display of classicizing statuary, in his turn claiming that such gestures are the privilege of the Greek authorities only. At the same time, however, Kaminis undermines the government of his own country, a government to which he is politically opposed and about to run against in the national election, in effect accusing Greece's prime minister at the time of treason by reminding everyone else of the long gone Macedonian hero the Greek left has surrendered to the enemy. At the time, therefore, when the leaders of the opposition vowed to revoke the Prespa agreement should they win the approaching election, Alexander statue invades the capital's public space in order to politicize it. And with it, of course, uh, reorganize the capital's inhabitants as a population of archaeophile bodies aware of their nation's classical heritage and ready to defend it against any foreign usurper or local traitor. The new statue is used to administer to the Athenian demos its rediscovered shared classicality, which in contemporary Greece functions as an alter ego to patriotism. Athenian citizenry is then reorganized into a mass of disposable bodies happy to be made live as more than subjects to an ancient king, or if they must, happy to be let die by the long gone conqueror general. As a political gesture, the inauguration of the statue strikes me both as old fashioned and as post democratic. On the one hand, it regresses to an old school kind of public space politics that has remained unchanged since the interwar years, if not earlier. And on the other, the decision to carry out the inauguration as a political stand of sorts is post-democratic that means to substitute state policy, turning it into an empty shell to a performance of highly politicized archaeology. The statue here is used to repurpose antiquity on behalf of a political economic elite who mobilizes public sentiment through a call to archaeologic as well as pseudo-historical sentiment. Although I do not mean, of course, to suggest that the mayor of Athens at the time was a fascist or even that his politics was, his deployment of archaeopolitics as a means to sort out his city's population cannot help but bring to one's mind the systematic attempts at repurposing antiquities from the interwar uh, years. What we witness is an attempt to govern modern populations through the bodies of the ancients, a conscious effort to map contemporary urban life based on the archaeologic sentiments inscribed into the uh, population. As with Mussolini and Franco, Alexander's statues in Athens, Thessaloniki, or Skopje are not set up as mere declarations of national sovereignty, nor do they stand as its representations alone. They are deployed as tools through which to reformulate the political, while at the same time undo the demos um, in the, the sense of uh, when Brown is using the term. For if we accept that after an almost decade long worldwide economic recession from 2008 to roughly 2019, followed by a global pandemic in 2020 and 2021, um, we have entered an, on international scale what has been described as the post democracy stage in our societies, I would suggest that archaeopolitics, like biopolitics, tends to fare better under this new regime. Archaeopolitics, as a post-democratic tool in itself, 
is devised as a means to mobilize identity consolidations in times of uncertainty, and furthermore, to inform our imaginings of our pasts into the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dimitri, for this uh, very rich uh, uh, pr presentation, um, both on the uh, visual side and, of course, on the on the analysis. Um, as we wait uh, for, uh, for 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 questions, I think that I would like to claim uh, moderator privilege and uh, uh, get the ball rolling because uh, there is a lot that uh, uh, was kind of stirred in my mind as you were giving. Uh, uh, these, uh, these these images and uh, and uh, uh, I want to think a bit about the specific location of of, of that statue because uh, uh, that in and of itself uh, opens us to other to 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 interesting interpretations and counter narratives. Uh, just opposite this statue is one of the few buildings in Athens where you can still visibly see the pot marks of bullets from the Decembriana which uh, in the series narrative of uh, the, from Indignados to taking power was central in sorting Greeks into uh, different categories as well. Uh, so it's almost as if that statue is attempting to uh, lead, uh, lead the population past one sort of use of the past, uh, more recent archeopolitics if you want, through the claim that it makes on space uh, towards another one, nostalgic perhaps of the 90s that uh, might have been nationalist, but uh, uh, at the same time before all these crises that uh, strike us. So it's, it's a fascinating uh, uh, location uh, that, we, that, we, that we have there. Uh, as a Byzantinist, I'll, I'll ask you a question, however, that takes us a bit uh, further back. Uh, when I when I look at uh, uh, sort of uh, the, the history of the uh, polity that we describe as uh, 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 Byzantium or uh, uh, the, the, the medieval Roman Empire or the succession to the Roman Empire in the East, uh, I see similar phenomena of uh, uh, uses of the past and mo mobilizations of the past by Christians and pagans uh, as new identities are reformulated in new emerging regimes in the Mediterranean world. And I wonder uh, as a, a archeologist and as a student of, uh, of, the, of the ancient world, how you see this modern archeopolitical uh, uh, sort of uh, work and thinking, uh, perhaps applying to, to earlier periods uh, where uh, uh, perhaps parallel phenomena might be taking place. What can we take from the modern theorizing uh, into thinking about uh, these questions in, let's say, my era, or, and I'm thinking about uh, Roman laws on how, in the Christian era, on how to treat uh, statues that were religious as cultural monuments and denude them of uh, their uh, uh, sacredness. I'm thinking of Honiatis' evocation on the classical past and things like that. Uh, certainly. Um, well, <laughs> we all know that it's, uh, it's, it's rather um, uh, shaky to try to, to, to even believe that we have always been modern, that uh, modernity is just uh, comes, comes back in, in cycles. Um, and uh, I think we would have to, to try very hard to find a truly biopolitical or archipolitical, as I would call it, use of the past in, in the past, um, Rome, Byzantium, or, or I don't know, medieval England. Um, because the, the idea uh, about archaeopolitics is not that it's, it's just archaeophilia, okay, people tend to love antiquity, to like or dislike ancient art um, or classical art for, art for that matter, but the idea that um, there is a, an embodied rationale behind our love, that um, the, the, the past is, is ours and that, that it is us, it defines us and then we have to fight for it. So, um, if we find an, a, a, a Byzantine emperor or, or, a, or, a, or an English king or a Viking warlord, whoever, who sends their men to, to battle, um, claiming uh, this sort of uh, archaeological uh, arguments, then uh, I would be interested and I, I would be willing to sit down and, and look at, at the um, uh, specifics of it to, to decide to determine if, if it's, this is this is by political and archipolitical or or not. Um, so, that, so the, the, um, because um, because as as an archaeologist, I am always fascinated by this um, um, 
by Lasker is his uh, uh, text. This is an episode, I think, um, in Pergamon. And he, he 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 sits there and he 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 is he is overwhelmed. He's mesmerized by the ruins. And but he, he he doesn't call himself a Greek. He says, "Well, we we are sort of Greeks. We 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 are Greek in a sense." He says he doesn't he doesn't. And he certainly doesn't doesn't mean this about his subjects. He says, "Well, yeah. well, you know, we're we're ancient enough." But <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I just want to interrupt for a second and say, since um, John Siegel has a question there, and there are also some mm -hmm. questions. Q&A, but I have, um, I've, I've put him up there to allow him to talk. Juna, if you want, we can also, uh, you could, you can show your face too, but it's entirely up to you. Don't want to put you on the spot, but since Juna is actually going to join us in Athens, hopefully, um, I thought it would be good to, to allow him to introduce himself and ask the question. Oh, sh sure. I, I don't know. I, oh my goodness. I'm not sure I can show myself. I don't have that option. I, I, I will and just. That's no loss, but I mean, either way. No, 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 but, but I think that it, well, now that we're, let me, let me make you a panelist for a moment. Um, um, uh, for whatever, give me a second. I'm, I'm learning, I'm learning. Uh, Be a lot of build up, uh, a very disappointing conclusion, really. <laughs> well, actually, as it turns out, I can't do them, right. anything about it, because I, I, I can't seem to. So, so ask your question anyway. All right, yeah. so I'll be a disembodied voice. I'm sorry. Uh, so yeah, uh, my name is Jonas Siegel. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm at uh, Rutgers. Uh, in, in English, and I'm very, uh, I was intrigued by, by the presentation. I, I had a, a sort of a conceptual political question uh, given, uh, given the presentation. I'll, I'll just read what I said because it'll be quicker. I'd like to hear more about the relationship between desire and manipulation or between politics and ideology. Um, so I wrote down that archaeopolitics is a collective desire for the materiality of the past. So a collective desire for the materiality of the past. Um, that seems desire or the group has a desire. Oh, cool, I've lost my question. Let's just see if we'll come back. Oh yeah, here it is. Um, but then a, a lot of the instances seem to be not about a group desire, but so much as about a, as a, a political manipulation by, by, a, by an elite. So I was just curious about the relationship of those issues in the argument. I'm, I, it's clear that this argument wants to be more or is more than about Propaganda or a subset of yeah. that. So, I, I, but you know, given that the instances were not like uh, this, this group expressing a desire so much as a set of specific political agents trying to manipulate public opinion, I thought this might be an opportunity to kind of tease out the distinctions that the project wants to make, but that the instances might be pushing in a different direction, if that's fair to say. You know, well, the way you put it, you 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 sound right. But uh, my uh, my definition of archaeopolitics is not that it is a collective desire for the materialities of the past, but the assumption that there is such a thing, um, the pre-assumption that your public, your citizens, uh, the members of your party, the members of your nation, um, love or owe to love the materialities of the past, uh, that they, they, they have inherently, because they were born Greeks or Italians or whatever, um, they carry in themselves uh, this desire for the materialities of the past and that they ought to be ready to sac even sacrifice themselves um, um, for, for this, for, to, to honor this, this desire and this, and this past. Um, so this is, this, is, this is what I mean by uh, a, a politics that becomes archaeological, not that um, it, uh, it tries to invest uh, a statue with a meaning, all statues have meanings, but the, the idea that um, um, your, your, um, your political arguments become archaeological, uh, they uh, are performances of excavations or of museum exhibitions or displays in the public sphere of statues and and that sort of that sort of thing. So this is this is um, what I uh, I call um, archaeopolitics. The first the assumption that there is such a desire and then the manipulation of this desire in order to um, uh, to affect your your political. Uh, um, uh, gains of purposes based on the past rather than the, the present. Um, and of course, this is something that other people have noticed. And uh, 
um, um, for example, um, I remember the, um, the, the very well known um, description of the, 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 the Pergamon um, altar in the, the first pages of the, of the novel, the, the, um, uh, the Aesthetics of Resistance. Uh, can't remember the name of the of the author right now, uh, German. Um, uh, where obviously he, he understands that the, the, the this this massive art uh, had a political meaning back in antiquity, which he uses to um, uh, to explain uh, how uh, uh, art uh, works by politically in his present, which is uh, Germany of the nineteen thirties. All right, thank you. That's a really helpful clarification, I think. Thanks. Uh, let me also, if I can jump in for a second on that, right? I mean, what's interesting is how that manipulation can also become very successful in the, cre in the creation of desire, right? So I'm, I'm actually thinking of the Indian case uh, where, you know, all the stuff around Ayodhya and uh, the uh, Babri and the Mabri Mosque and the destruction of is, is um, I mean, there are instances in Greece also, but, but, but more, but in India right now, it's, it's been extraordinary. And I mean, I found myself at a conversation where I was actually going to be talking about um, um, on, on New Jersey state television. And I, I, I said I was doing some stuff on the reception of antiquity and archeology. span And this guy, a part of the Indian diaspora here, uh, suddenly started talking about the Ramayana having mapped all of the world all of the Indian world, right? And, and then uh, proceeded to give a defense of Modi, right? And, and so it was a kind of, uh, and in, in India, it's been, I think, quite successful as well in the current uh, Hindutva moment. So, so in, 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 in its ability to mobilize a kind of uh, a political affect, it seems to me to have been quite something. Um, now, how that's working, I don't, you know, I don't, presume to know fully, but but we'll be having, uh, we'll be talking more about this on October 21st. Let me it, 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 is, it is working because it, 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 is a, it is a very convenient vehicle for, for racism because it, it, it runs on the same, the same line uh, as racism. Because if you're ancient, um, you can't be asked to share your land with uh, newcomers, with people who are not as ancient as you or who are a different kind of ancient than you. So this is a problem solved. There's no, there's no way you can negotiate anything because you are ancient, you're classical, you're Roman, you're Greek, and they're not, and that's it. So this is why it works. Um, so uh, we have uh, a question from Gail uh, Zerubabel. Uh, how would you uh, compare the role of statues in the public sphere to the role of official iconography, such as the use of ancient uh, imagery on coins, money, or festivals performed uh, in the public sphere incorporating uh, archaeopolitical um, uh, expressions? Uh, yes, they, they are comparable. And in, in my forthcoming book, I have included a lot of, a lot of that. <laughs> but they chose to speak about statues. Um, there is a thing about statues because um, um, sta if you think about it archaeologically, um, statues are uh, one of the rarest find in, 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 in an archaeological uh, dig. I mean, I've been an, an excavator for, <laughs> for decades and I've never found a statue myself yet. Um, uh, and although none of my students, I think, have either, if you ask anyone, anyone, uh, what it is about uh, Greek art that they enjoy or they, they think it's most important, they, they will start with agalmata, agalmata. They will say statues. They won't say um, buildings, vases, coins, or inscriptions. Uh, they will go for statues. So statues, because of course they're corporeal, they're as good as living and all that, they make, they make more sense. Now, um, in a, a long time ago, just after the, uh, the Athens Olympics, I wrote, I wrote a paper on the opening ceremony of that, of that uh, Olympia, the 2004 um, opening ceremony, um, which is um, exactly this, this thing I'm talking about, the idea that 
um, uh, classical Greece is a bunch of statues becoming alive and that we are those statues. Um, so this, this is archaeopolitical because it enforces more for the internal rather than external purposes, it enforces the idea of a, a breathing, living nation, which is as good looking as a Greek statue. <laughs> Dimitri, your, your story. Your... Yeah, uh, I'll keep that uh, as an argument. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'll move to uh, Jesse uh, Sigel, uh, who thanks you for uh, this terrific presentation and is wondering if you can address the conflicts created by our politics in terms of how uh, to use the past. In the uh, uh, former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, there appeared to be a debate about whether the archaeological past in the four in the form of significant ruins should be sacralized or modernized to create historical claims in the present. Uh, I'm thinking, uh, Jesse uh, notes, uh, in particular of Lake Okrid, where at least uh, in 2015, the Macedonian government was constructing a university on concrete supports over uh, the top of uh, ancient uh, church ruins, sacrificing the ruins integrity to, the, to advance the claim that it was the site of the first Slavic uh, university. Yeah, and um, also I didn't have the time to go into Skopje 2014 uh, project very much, but I should, uh, I should add, because it's unfair not to, that it, it's, it's no more. I mean, they, 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 after the, the agreement with, with Greece, they decided to take it back. So the, the, most of those statues are now down, uh, back again. So, but there is a, there's a, there's a certain, there's a, there's, a, there's a notable turn in uh, North Macedonia, towards uh, their medieval past, so the, 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 which is also an archaeopolitical decision to make. So the idea was that we have, we have to, to choose between um, different versions of our past, um, which is uh, nationalism 101. You have to, to write down a coherent, linear um, historical narrative for your nation. Um, so in the beginning, they tried to do to be to be like Greece, so to go back to antiquity and take it from there. Um, and as you know, in Greece, the problem is always Byzantium. We don't really know what to do with it. Paripopoulos had a good idea, so this is what we're doing still, um, all those uh, decades after him. Um, but um, the, I think the Northern Macedonians decided to bet on their Byzantine sort of medieval uh, past rather than try to, to claim uh, uh, Macedonian-ness uh, going, going back to antiquity simply because they don't have the archeology, span meaning that they don't have the sites. So the, the, because this is, this is the, the, this is, I think, um, crucial for, the, for, the, for this sort of uh, argument, the idea that um, if, if the land where everything happened is in your nation state now, then you can lay claim to it. If it's not, it's a problem. So this, is, this, is, this, is, this would explain um, Ocrid, I, I, would, I would think. And this would explain why the Greek um, uh, state is not really interested in what, what, what's going on in uh, Byzantine Thessaloniki in terms of archaeology. <laughs> yeah. So they're, they're, well, they're, they're happy to get rid of it or redo it in a sort of uh, 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 fake uh, version because they're, they're not really interested in it. Yeah, because it doesn't fit the Paparigopoulian uh, continuity with its Roman. It's, it's not. It's not uh, crucial right. for the for the for the Hellenic yeah. narrative. So it can go. But but what you but what you discuss about the embeddedness of monuments in space uh, raises questions of autochthony that then can be connected directly to the racist lineages that you want to discuss. Uh, so yeah. uh, this is uh, Irini. You want to uh, ask uh, your question? I should not be reading your words. I didn't want to interrupt. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. I wanted to ask if you could please comment on uh, the female figures and statues and the imagined Greek past. If something can be said, particularly in Athens, or do we have any examples? Or what is the gender dimension uh, of archaeopolitics as it is uh, in place uh, manifested in the capital of, of Greece? You, you mean uh, statues of ancient Greek women? 
Yes. Will there any? I mean, uh, as exactly. I to my students, uh, ancient Greeks were all men. Uh, the, the, there were no women in ancient Greece, obviously. Um, but, well, there are few. There are there are a few. Um, uh, there are some uh, some uh, personifications. I, I think there's a there's a, a an Alantica bust of uh, of a woman that I think needs to be. Um, Athens or the Acropolis itself, something like that. She's wearing the Acropolis on her head, um, repeatedly vandalized because it's, it's in a really bad spot. Um, uh, there is a statue of Aspasia uh, for some reason, uh, I think mostly because she was Pericles' wife. Um, I, can't, I can't think of any, of any other women. The, 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 there's a Pericles, there's a Theseus, there's an Icarus, um, you know. Um, um, and um, all the, all the, I think all the, all, most of the full-bodied um, statues in in Athens right now are those of men. So you have many Venizeluses, Tricupises, uh, even Atiliyanis, uh, Macriyanis, and all these. Um, you have a few uh, female busts, obviously. Aliki um, Buyuklaki. Uh, Papayani, who was executed, um, uh, but uh, not not a full. I don't think there's there is any. Which which again is uh, an insightful observation in terms of how it's a male imagined uh, or uh, presented past and, and deployed, if you like, in the capital of Athens. In, in a way, this is this is the past we we have inherited. The question with this is that whether we need to edit, as I said in the very beginning, we need to edit this past, whether we should be satisfied with that or we'll say, oh, it's okay. Well, the Greeks were a patriarchal society. What can you do? That's it. You have all those men sitting around writing their books. So this is what we can, we can uh, live with. We have to live with. Um, so, but if we decide that we need to edit this past and we, we need to edit this art, um, classical or neoclassical, then we need to sit down and, and do some real work. And uh, Mr. Papas and the well, the late Papas and the and the and Alexander statue and Mr. Cummings, you know, are a, a rather um, the an odd tune in this in this in this discussion. I I want to say something which I which I find also very interesting. Right. So the first time I went as an adult to to Greece. I mean, I should say that as a child, I was taken with my parents to Athens, Prague, and Rome, the last and so there we were based in Singapore, and that's what we did. But, um, um, and I, I still remember having nightmares, uh, because we went to uh, the Acropolis, and then the, we were told about the birth of uh, Athena coming out of the head, right? And for years I had this, this nightmare about it, right? Because it was just terrifying to me, this like head bursting open and a person coming out. But that's a different story. I think I might start my current book with that story. But, but then I come back, uh, thanks to Dimitri Kralis's invitation to teach in the Hellenic Studies program, right? And I had no interest in ruins at all. Like, it's really like I'm an act no interest whatsoever. But I wanted to, you know, go teach somewhere else. So we went and we were in Kefalonia, I think we started at Kefalonia, rather. And I remember that there was a guy who ran the kiosk in the port town. I remember the mystery, and you know, we were, and he was going to give us, uh, and Ithaca was nearby, I think. And so he was going to give us a tour of everywhere that Odysseus stepped, right? And, and, and this is so ubiquitous as an experience in Greece, right? Where, speaking of it, the imagination of the nation, right? Where um, people are constantly, you know, on the streets. This is, and also partly addressed to Juno, right? I mean, this, the kind of a capacity to get mobilized by this, right? Um, um, uh, so, I, uh, you know, he was gonna give me a, uh, he was gonna give me a tour. Then, um, uh, well, we're at a in Delphi. I'm in Delphi with a field school, another field school, and I'm given a lecture. the the the, whole, the The tour guide is giving a lecture about how this was the navel of the world and the center of the world, and and even the professor leading the lecture has no problem with it, 
right? And I say something about Martin Bernal, just thinking that this person was radical. And uh, like, nobody is gonna to talk to me after that. Like literally all of these professors, right? Including these supposedly radical ones, like literally form this kind of huddle against me and I'm outside it. And it was a revelation for me because I, I actually thought this was all, you know, like, come on, these are, you know, progressive people and liberals at least, right? That they can't possibly have an investment. And so over and over again, right? I get, uh, I come up against this in Greece and have it over the past 13 years. And then one example was when I was in Crete and I just walked into a leather shop, right? And this guy um, uh, says to me, you can't be Greek. And I said, okay, I mean, not trying, but okay. Um, and, and he started talking about his DNA, how it's in the DNA, right? So what's, what's re and then about ancient Greece, again, right? So what's really interesting to me is in a place like Greece is how deeply it permeates the imagination, right? Uh, uh, that's kind of what's, what's striking. But I have a counterexample too. And that is, and maybe it's not a counterexample, maybe it is what you're calling, uh, maybe this is um, an effect of what you call the argumentality, right? Which is that it's so internalized, this notion that antiquity will decide for us, right? That in Pakistan, for instance, in the, north, in the northern parts, uh, a kind of a relationship with, with this antiquity, Indo-Greek, right, and, and Bactrian, is then used to push up against the Muslim nationalism of the state, right? Look, that we have a deeper, we have a, a broader history. Um, so it's also becomes a space of contestation. Um, and, 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 and it's one of the things that explains uh, the destruction of the Bamiyan statues, the Daesh uh, destructions in Syria, because there's um, the kind of secular nationalists claim these irreligious, so to speak, or non-Abrahamic non histories as their own, right? And so then the Islamists come and destroy those history, those because they're associated with the secular nationalists. So in the Middle East, this has been one of the contestations. So I don't know how you would think of that in relation to what you're saying, right? Because these are contestatory politics of the nation. Oh, this is this is why they're devised to to be to be. Uh... A, a field of uh, of discontent to 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 be to be a, a field of conflict, um, and this is this is this is why they're deployed. The, this is why they're put they're put there. Um, although it seems to me that Greece is um, is is a, is rather alone right now to 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 be maintaining this sort of thinking in its neighborhood. Um, I don't I don't think this is as strong in Italy as it used to be. No, it isn't. Perhaps yeah. it never was. Um, uh, you get it in in other parts of our of our area. You get it in Bulgaria, perhaps. You used to get it in North Macedonia. You get it in Albania sometimes. Um, but uh, um, I think um, uh, you would have to try hard to find a sort of um, interwar politics so deeply embedded in 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 Greek. Um, uh, imaginary Greek imaginings of ourselves right now. Um, um, now, when 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 you come to places like Syria and um, the 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 Muslim uh, 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 conflicts and the of course the, the Taliban and everything, um, there you have you have different different factors of play uh, um, because there is this um, sort of. Uh, uh, quasi-religious uh, distrust of art, anyway. Uh, so this this is a, a factor that we, we don't really get in 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 our parts of the of the world as much. It is used, though. It is used in the archaeopolitical record rhetoric of Greece. The idea that refugees from uh, uh, from Syria or from other, from other parts of the Muslim world are coming here to destroy our churches. So this is this is a sort of interesting uh, argument you get, and you do you do get it, and, and most 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 people in the city believe that. I mean, uh, I, to to follow on um, on, on Sadia's uh, 
home. And uh, I think that uh, uh, what uh, perhaps because of the fetishization of, uh, of, of uh, uh, the ancient past uh, in school books uh, that we basically get uh, shoved down our throats uh, the, from uh, day one at school all the way to graduation and, um, and beyond. Um, there is kind of a, uh, if you want an archeological vernacular, however badly di um, sort of digested, where people will either walk you around places in imaginary fashion by mobilizing whatever they've heard and uh, you know, they've been living in, um, so there is a discourse, even if it, if it can be uninformed, uh, and uh, in that way, the ground is really well set up for also campaigns of uh, shaping the discourse because people are ready to play by those rules. I had a meeting yesterday with uh, two young um, uh, uh, artists, uh, writers who uh, participated in the creation of uh, a, a Greek uh, graphic novel on Byzantine history, Theophanoi has come out. And um, they they've went to they went to pre to present their work at a, a Comic Con uh, uh, event, and it was really fascinating because the moment they appeared with Byzantium in Comic Con, which uh, tends to have a bit of a certain audience that is more left, etc., immediately they were branded as either right wing or religious, even though what they were trying to do is to disrupt the Paparigopoulos narrative of continuity through the novel and uh, think of this Roman identity. So we are predisposed. Uh, through our digestion of all this fetishized past. And then of course, on how we canalize it uh, on the basis of our own um, uh, political stances uh, to really work with this past as a, uh, in fairly intricate, not necessarily informed ways. And then of course, when you dump into that and organize narrative, we, we have ways of plugging into that and, and connecting. It's, it's fascinating. So what you're saying is, I mean, just to follow up, and then I think um, if there's one more question, we can take it, otherwise we should end soon, mm -hmm. um, is that, so when you say, Dimitri Plantz, that, 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 you know, um, that um, uh, it's designed that way, right? I mean, I wanna, I wanna push a little here, right? Because, are you saying that it's designed when you know when the, the, there's contestation that the 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 story is designed to manage conflict in that way or is that an unintended consequence because it sounds to me that um the music is saying that um uh, it's so well programmed that you know sort of the disc it, it's so kind of uh, shaping up the discursive field and the imagination say, let's just stick with the Greek example because it's a neat example, it's love, right? That um, even contestation happens within those parameters, right? But you're saying something else, which I, I, I'm, I don't know if I fully buy. I mean, I like it, but it's like, that it's designed, that it's not, is it designed to elicit that conflict or is it just that once it's in, that, that the, the instantiation is so, of this, this regime of what is essentially also the imagination is so, um, is so expansive that it, that, it, that it also ends up, that, that, that contestation has to be on those terms because that's what's being contested. Do you, do you see the distinction I'm trying to make here? Yeah, I, 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 I see what, what, what you're talking about. Um, I, I believe that, yes, of course, there's this, this amazing landscape of classical desire around us, which we have been cultivating for, for, for so long through our museums and our, our uh, uh, school books, and uh, as uh, Dimitris just said. Um, but then, when, when you're trying to make an argument, um, it, it don't, you don't necessarily, as a modern politician, I mean, like the mayor of Athens, um, who's running a, a national election, you don't really need to go back to Alexander the Great. When you're trying to nationalize the Saloniki uh, against the 19th century threat, why do you have to go back to Alexander the Great? I mean, Neither Philip nor Alexander ever saw Thessaloniki. Thessaloniki was founded after the death. Uh, they, ne they never went there. Uh, the Athenians had the party when Alexander died. 
uh, they were so happy he was gone and they revolted against the Macedonian army the day after. I mean, why on earth would, you, would, you, would anyone think that we need, that Athens needs yet another statue and actually a statue of Alexander? And it was done, um, Caminus was waiting eight years in, in his office and he did it two weeks just before he left. Uh, the mayorship, and, and he just did it for modern, present day political purposes. So this is what I mean by design. It's there, of course, of course it's there in the, in the books. You, he did not invent Alexander, but he did invent a, an anti-Syriza Alexander that day. And that was an argument, and it was like, you know, um, a nod to uh, the voters who were going to vote against Syriza uh, within the space of a few weeks. Um, because uh, regardless what the, the government at the time um, was claiming and uh, was arguing, uh, the vast majority of Greeks was against the, the treaty and the agreement with um, North Macedonia. And they insisted that the name should be um, unchanged, that they shouldn't, they shouldn't be called Macedonia or anything uh, like that. So um, this is what I mean by, by design. You, you have this, this um, repertoire, you, this toolkit, and you just, it just lies there, but then it comes a time when you use it um, and it's very, very effective. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, what will follow in our uh, uh, coming events and to how we pick up the thread and um, and uh, and uh, take it further. Uh, and uh, I want to thank uh, our panelists and uh, our audience for uh, their questions and um, uh, participations participation. And uh, I'll pass it on to Sadia for uh, perhaps a final word uh, on where we go next uh, before we uh, wrap up for uh, tonight. Uh, thank you again, Dimitri. Thank you so much, everybody. And thank you, Dimitri, for both the Dimitris. Uh, you know, it's going to be even more interesting in Athens because there'll be three Dimitris there. So uh, it's going to be a um, need we, we to, uh, to come up with some uh, affectionate or, or, or mocking um, diminutives here. I mean, so, uh, but, but in any case, I mean, they'll become mocking over time, I think. But it was a wonderful talk and a great inaugural lecture for, for our collaboration. Um, I'm also delighted that we got a nice audience for the first CES event. Um, and uh, stay tuned everybody for our next uh, event, which is an Afghanistan round table on the 20th of September, but then also, and there'll be more events that are CES related, but we will also have our next archaeopolitics and colonialism and interwar Europe event on October 21st, where we will be extending this conversation to colonial um, um, Britain, Greece, and uh, sorry, colonial India and British colonialism, Poland, and so the Soviet Union and um, and um, India, Modi's India now. Um, Tamara Sears will be speaking, so will Jan Kubik, and I will be presenting from my um, current research on Curzon. Um, thank you everyone for being here.